Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Catherine Lofton, Professor of Religious Studies and American Studies. She's a historian of religion with a particular focus on cultural and intellectual history of the United States through studies of preachers and parents, soap and office cubicles, and liberal theology, Professor Lofton has developed a portrait of religion in America that emphasizes the formation of religion through new technologies, renegade manifestos, and cornucopias of cultural practices that contribute to social identity in the modern world. Today we'll talk with Professor Lofton about her first book, Oprah, The Gospel of an Icon. Welcome, Professor Lofton. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm very excited to have you here today. Um, I do love Oprah, so I am very excited to hear about your book. Let's talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, one of the main reasons I wrote the book was because of that feeling, mm -hmm. that I met so many people throughout my life who would say that so easily. I love Oprah. Mm -hmm. How many things in culture do we say that about, Marilyn? Not so many. unequivocally, this, right. that's a good. And that quickly made me think about, well, what is good about Oprah? Mm -hmm. And that was the premise of my research. What okay. makes us think there's a good in her that we all want to follow? Right, right. So what is that good? Yeah, one of the key things I think I, I ended up finding was that she wants to license all of us mm -hmm. to find the gospel of you. Mm -hmm. And that is to know that your best life is the only path you need to follow. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way troubling men, get out of the way bad bosses, get out of the way acne that makes you have low self-esteem. She's going to improve all parts of your life and focus you on finding your best you. And my book tracks how she does that through various public rituals and the ways that she engages her audience to participate with her and mm -hmm. everything from thinking through childhood traumas to reading great works of literature to doing mass new bra fittings so that you can find the right way to present yourself to mm -hmm. the world. Okay. So how does that tie into religion? Yeah. One of the theses of my book is to find another single image in the United States or a single figure that you would say represents our religious now. Mm -hmm. Sociologists have observed three major trends right now. Mm -hmm. One, very few people would claim a single denominational identity. Mm -hmm. Two, people want therefore the right to claim multiple identities, to say, I'm a Jew, but I am really interested as well in yoga. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in yoga, but sometimes I think a Catholic funeral really makes sense of the death I've experienced. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to mix and match. Mm -hmm. And three, we have in general a great desire to find personal happiness mm -hmm. and that whatever religious practices we're taking up, they seem to be driven more often by the pursuit of that happiness than an understanding of a faraway deity. Mm -hmm. And in all three of those patterns, I think Oprah is the paragon. She is the representative of those trends and I think is an icon of our present religious age in the United mm -hmm. States. Okay, so what about all of the atheists out there? How so, does that relate to Oprah? Absolutely. And, and <laughs> I think Oprah is amazing because she seems to anyone who watches her, uh -huh. they make arguments that she is them. So on any given day, you can see Oprah talk about a lot of different subjects. But no matter what the subject she's talking about, she always seems to be both critical and trying to find belief again. Mm -hmm. So for the atheists that watch Oprah, they see a person who was once in a Christian church and talks very openly about being in Baptist churches where she hated the male leadership, hated the doctrine, hated the rules, and now she's found her own way and her own independence. Mm -hmm. So that very idea that her rationalism got herself out of a bad religious frame, mm -hmm. that's a classic plot of the atheist. Now Oprah really wants to argue it out with atheists and most recently had a very public interview where a woman said, you know, I'm an atheist and Oprah said, no you're not. Anyone with your kind of spirit <laughs> can't not believe. So Oprah tends to think there is no such thing as actual atheism. There's uh -huh. just varieties of expansive theism into which she would argue all of us. Right, right. Um, Okay, so let's go back to some specific examples of the effect of the Oprah phenomenon Absolutely. on religion in modern America. So I was thinking a lot about what I wanted my first book to be. When I was mm -hmm. in graduate school, I wrote about late 19th century religious people and the ideas of the modern they had. And for most academics, that's what you do. You write a first book based on your nerdy dissertation research. Uh -huh. But when I went out into the world and became a teacher, uh, I discovered that for students, the question of why that past mattered 
seemed to be a very big question. Why should they care about Presbyterians in the 19th century? Mm -hmm. As I was having that pedagogical experience, I also watched, as we all did, the ascent of Barack Obama, a person who I, I feel I write about in the book is very deeply tied to the Oprah phenomenon. In what way? So th there's three ways I, I connect him. Um, first is the absolute necessity of a first-person narrative to enter public life, that the memoir is now going to be the key transaction, the thing mm -hmm. you give the public to expose your sins but also narrate your personal self into the myth of America. Mm -hmm. And his memoir and the success of that is really being his first bid into public office. And that's very similar, of course, to Oprah, yes. where, you know, if you know anything about Oprah, her beginnings, you know, very troubled, you know, drug use, you know, and yes. then to her media, her great rise Absolutely. to, you know, being a multi-media mogul billionaire. And one of the key things that allows her to do and Obama to do is to say, you have to always remember I'm human mm -hmm. and my the way in which I continue to be a good leader for you is I've been everywhere you've been. Mm -hmm. And the only difference between you and me is I found a way to package it so it doesn't bring me down. It doesn't continue to be a symptom. It continues to lift me up to say those, those troubles, which gives you the space to in some ways still be a sinner and to still mm -hmm. struggle in public. But that's not altogether true because there's a second theme I want to bring up that, that brings Oprah and, and Obama together, and that is that they're both deeply committed to a public civilizational project, that, that the best self is one that looks put together, that has well-fitting clothes, that treats yourself with respect in public. Mm -hmm. And I think the kind of image of the Obamas is this almost iconic 50s era family where everyone's very well dressed, there's no misbehavior. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear, Sasha is not on Facebook. <laughs> Even the dogs are well behaved. Yeah. There's a sense of good behavior as a sign of a good interior mm -hmm. and that that's one of the key lessons of, of Oprah's spiritual practice. And Obama also clearly endorses that. And then third, I would say a resistance to allowing concepts of difference to make us different from one another. So mm -hmm. for both Oprah and Obama, they have a profound desire to say, we are all the same. Our differences are only important insofar as they tell us the particular economic or social struggles. But if we're going to come to any kind of solutions, we have to let go of those differences and find our common humanity. Mm -hmm. And for Oprah, that's why she's been able to attract. I mean, who would have thought a woman born in segregation south, a woman of very, very poor origins, would become the image of middle class white women in America who weep on her bosom and tell them all her troubles? Mm -hmm. Well, she did that by saying, I am just like you. There is no profound difference between my blackness and your whiteness insofar as we're both people who have suffered because, and then let's list out all those little reasons mm -hmm. that make life hard. Right. But those reasons in Oprah's world are never critiques of economy or politics or social stratification. They're always struggles of the mind and the way that the mind can recognize its best possibility. Mm -hmm. And Obama has a very similar message, which is why I think for some liberals he's a frustrating leader because his solutions are not always structural revisions. He often asks us, just be a better you, work harder for your country, mm -hmm. and I'll do what I can. But at the end of the day, Obama's not big government, and neither is Oprah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about Oprah's, uh, the school that she opened up for girls in yes. Africa. How does that fit into your book? So I, I talk about that in a chapter where I take up the question of the mission mm -hmm. as a concept of Oprah's life, but also of broader American religious history. There is a, uh, a quotation by a great American religious history scholar from the early 20th century where he says, don't mistake yourself, all Americans are missionaries. And makes a claim that to be American is to be a very proposition for come over here, it's a better life here. And Oprah is just a, a beautiful icon of that mm -hmm. in her own tiny labors with individual women. But the school was born of a fantasy that I tie into a larger African-American narrative of returning to Africa and bringing the improvements of the United States back there. And so she, like a lot of late 19th century African-American women who devoted themselves to the missionary cause, these were women who were not returning to Africa because they wanted to reclaim their Africanness. They were returning to Africa to bring Christianity and American politics and American education to them. And so Oprah does this, and, and I describe in detail the way that she forms a school based very much off of the desire of creating a perfect physical space. So much effort is put into the physicality. And as a contrast to the girls she brings to the school, who she says come from these really destitute and difficult material mm -hmm. contexts. And I talk a lot about how in contemporary geopolitics we think, well, if you have the right sweater and a good pair of jeans and the right books on your lap, you're going to be better. That there's a kind of osmotic effect that materials have, especially those that come from the United States. And 
Oprah definitely went into the project thinking, what these girls have is spirit. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. But what they don't have is good things. So mm -hmm. I'm going to bring them good knowledge and good things and remake their lives. But doesn't that fly in the face of being not materialistic? How does that fit into the religious aspect? I know this is one of the hardest things for people to take up when they take up both Oprah as a religion but also contemporary American religious life. That mm -hmm. for a lot of more liberal religious thinkers, there's something really antithetical about the relationship between materiality mm -hmm. and spirituality. But Oprah's not alone in the history of religions of seeing that there's a profound connection between those two mm -hmm. things. Whether you think about the Eucharist or um, worship at Hindu shrines, uh, there's been a long tradition of making a connection between materiality and even prosperity as signs of spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. And Oprah, I link her in a tradition of two things. One, um, evangelical theology, in particular prosperity gospel theology, mm -hmm. which tells us that those diamonds are a sign that he loves you. So if you've got them, that's just a sign of your own prosperity, your own excellence, and the way that you're giving something good mm -hmm. to the world. But similarly, I also link her up to a, a train of something called New Thought, which is a, a spirituality movement that happened in the late 19th century in America that really emphasized how much all materiality around you is a representative of spirit. And so you can see this in the contemporary environmental movement where people talk about remaking physical spaces to be more environmentally responsible mm -hmm. as also just having better feng shui, better spiritual energy around them. <laughs> that if my house is no longer run by oil heat but instead by forced air, I'll just feel better. Mm -hmm. And New Thought Movement really believed that too. They were very into sort of whole health and, and the sense that there's a connection between the material world and right spiritual interior. Right, right. Okay. In your conclusion, you write, any descriptive iconic survey will return to the same point, to the in inseparability of consumer choice and religious option in the modern period. What do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, what I mean by that is, as in my field, we've had a lot of debates about mm -hmm. what it means to call the contemporary religious scene a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Is that a criticism to say that people treat religion like a set of consumer choices? I, I myself don't find that to be a problem. I think that mm -hmm. we live in a time where people do conceive of their religious life as a component of a broader sphere of uh, scheduling issues and consumer issues. And I think that over the course of the 20th century, we've increasingly seen that the religions that have survived the 20th century are those that also understand the marketplace as not a site of resistance, but of participation. Mm -hmm. And so I think of the way evangelical mega churches often have mal small mini malls attached to them, um, the way that anyone who wants to proffer spiritual advice has to find multiple modes to communicate that to you for a price. Uh, and I think Oprah is just a sort of a total encapsulation of the way that in, contemporary, in the contemporary world, we don't want to have to decide, is this good or is this bad on the grounds of consumption? We've decided consumption is the way we enact our morality. We live in an era where what we buy, what we text, what we like on Facebook are all articulations, I think, of our ethics. Mm -hmm. And we're also articulations, therefore, of our highest values. Whether or not we like that, that the consumer choice is the formatting of our ethics, mm -hmm. is for a philosophical debate. I'm yes. here to say, though, that Oprah has embraced that <laughs> and said, you know, texting this number to give $5 to water in Africa, she says that's fine. And I say most of American religious people agree with her. Right, right. OK. So what then are the broader implications of your book? There are three I identify that I think as you look forward, you're always going to see religious actors continuing uh -huh. to participate. And one is, I think, the end of seeking to narrate God and instead the endless desire to narrate the self. Mm -hmm. uh, one figure who is very iconic in this tradition is a man named William James, wrote this book, Varieties of Religious Experience. And when he wrote this in the early 20th century, many people thought it was so heretical because he spoke about how individual narrative mm -hmm. is really what religious experience is articulated as. And that was a time where people thought, no, religion is theology or it's obedience to God. We don't live in that time anymore. We live in William James's world mm -hmm. where narrating yourself, your first person story, is a part of the primary idea of spiritual practice. Second, I think we are no longer going to see uh, any kind of resistance to the concept of consumption as being not merely maybe an aspect of religious life, but its primary way of being articulated. I think we're going to see the ways that Facebook and other forms of social media are going to be new forms of congregation. Mm -hmm. And those are spaces where you can like and dislike and share information without an obvious 
single figurehead. Although Oprah is very essential as a charismatic leader, mm -hmm. the thing that her viewers most like is being connected to goods, connected to other people who like these ideas, these books. I think social media is increasingly going to take the place of our ideas of church hierarchy or church organization. Mm -hmm. And third, I think we're going to see increasingly the ways that there is going to be no political or economic program that will not be sold to us without also having an accompanying spiritual program. So keep an eye out for our leaders when they want to tell us to go take up that war in that faraway country or maybe have this sort of austerity practice. They're always going to attach to it a sort of this is good for you and therefore good for humanity. And you're going to see increasing language instead of God bless America, pursuits of spirit. You see already in advertising culture how much advertising culture talks about the spirit of you and the spirit of your own life being improved by the product. Mm -hmm. We're going to see this too in our leaders as they use the language of spirituality to convince us of, of projects they want to allure us to. So it isn't just that Oprah lives in a world. I also think she has influenced the world by suggesting that spirituality is a helpful language to get people to feel that the thing you're selling is the thing they want. Wow. Well, it certainly is a fascinating uh, thing to think about, <laughs> I have to say. So thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you so much. For more information about Professor Lofton and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you very much.